everybody today we're gonna learn about the sedimentary rocks um this is dr anna your geology professor and um this is the first segment of sedimentary rocks um some of you probably know that uh, most of the earth is covered with sedimentary rocks because everything else weathers away so the weathered material is gonna lay, lie on top of everything and then in the ocean uh the sediment is being collected so 75% of our earth surface is covered with sedimentary rocks. They're also important because not only that they cover most of the earth, but they contain a lot of economically very, very important geologic resources, such as the oil, the coal, your drinking water. So it's really, really important uh, to learn about them. So let's jump. First of all, we're going to learn about the processes which forming the sedimentary rocks. So we have to talk about weathering, transportation, accumulation, and diagenesis. So these four steps are very important. You've got to know because I, I will ask it on the test, but it's not important because I will ask it on the test. It's just generally important to understand. So the first is the weathering. So let's talk about the weathering. Um, in the next chapter, no, actually in the weathering chapter, we will talk more about the different weathering. So right here, we're just going to say the very, very basic things. We have two kinds of weathering. One is the physical, the other one is the chemical weathering. The physical weathering basically just includes the fragmentation of the original rocks, we can call parent rocks. And um, these happening because of uh, heat difference or... Um, the roots breaking up the rocks or rocks are falling because of the uh, freezing and thawing process. We're going to go and talk about this in detail later on. Um, but the main thing is that when you have physical weatherings, the rocks are just breaking up to smaller pieces, but there will not be chemical change. So therefore, from the fragments in the sedimentary rock, you will be able to tell what was the original rock. So this is very important in that way. When you look at a, a sandstone, you know what kind of rock it used to be before. So these are very useful information, even in historical geology. On the other hand, when you have chemical sedimentary rocks, the original rock composition is going to completely get destroyed. It will go through a true chemical change. It will go into solution. And then the chemical sedimentary rocks will precipitate out of the solution as a completely different uh, rock. So you will not be able to tell what was the original rock from the chemical sedimentary rock. The second process is the transportation. The transportation in, te in terms of sediment, if you think of sediment, can happen three ways. One is the glacier, the ice. The ice usually, if you think about like a lavina, lavina or um, uh, a snow avalanche, then you know that it will just take everything. It doesn't matter if it's huge piece of rock or it's small, teeny, tiny pieces, and it surrounded, surrounds the particles and it just takes everything. So there will not be any kind of sorting when the sediment is carried by the ice. If the sediment is carried by water, like in a river, then you will have at least two uh, major grain sizes because one which is being uh, transported on the bottom of the river, those are the bigger grain sizes, and the other one is is uh, the fine grain sediment which is always in the water, you know, like it's, it's like silt sized sediment in the water versus the bottom sediment which is just being dragged or saltated so that doesn't move as much as, as the silt size sediment, which is always in the water. The last type of uh, transportation material is the wind. If you think about the wind carries a lot of sediment, but, but uh, it actually does an excellent sorting because the wind can only pick up the same grain size more or less. So if you think about all these three, you have to also know which one would do what kind of sorting. And also if you think about the ice, the, the grains are surrounded with ice, so they will not be able to touch or, or, or kick each other. Whereas in the water, it's more so, 
and in the wind it's really a lot of kicking so in the wind the grains are going to be perfectly rounded in the water somewhat rounded and when they are in the ice they will not be rounded at all they're going to be very very angular and this takes us to where the sediment is going to settle down it can happen in on the continent like in river beds or lakes however you know anytime the conditions are changing like you have the river beds and there is a big storm coming all that sediment will be moved picked up and moved again so the ultimate place where the sediment can settle down is going to be in the ocean always and the process is called accumulation that's when the sediment deposits and accumulated on top of each other and the last process is is the the processes which making sedimentary rocks from the sediment and uh, the two major types you will have to know of course it's much more complicated in real life is the compaction and the cementation when we're talking about compaction imagine yourself being in your car laying on the back seat and 10 of your best friend laying on top of you so you understand what's gonna happen with you there yeah, you're going to get squeezed and some liquid will come out of you, of course. And that liquid, imagine, goes down into everybody else and uh, that might cause like some cementation. I'm just joking, of course. But you can imagine when you have the sediment and all the other layers going to settle down on top of it, then the, the lowermost layer is going to get squeezed so it get, gets much smaller and all the liquids are being squeezed out of them so therefore this is what we call compaction and the other the cementation many times you know the the fluids from the compaction will actually uh, go around and if there was any mineral in them which most likely there was that can precipitate in between the grains basically making glue in between the grain and that's what we call cementation so the compaction and the cementation. Now this picture here shows uh, carbonate, like limestone grains. We will talk more about them. And you can see calcite cementing it, calcite. And it's really interesting because on this picture, you can see a cathodoluminescence picture of the same. So in, in, in science labs, you will be able to tell uh, at what temperature and what kind of location this cement got into the sedimentary rock it's really amazing what kind of tools geologists have to actually learn about the the type of sedimentation the type of uh, diagenesis and and the place of the diagenesis and the temperature of the diagenesis which is kind of important if you if you um, think about it Okay, the next thing we have to talk about is the sedimentary structures. These are really amazing things because the sedimentary structures will tell us how did this rock form, rocks form, when, what kind of climate, what kind of latitude they formed on, and what kind of places they have come from. So it's really, really interesting. We'll have to talk about stratification, ripple marks, cross bedding mud cracks, graded bedding, trace fossils. Don't forget that when I say sedimentary structure on the test, these are the six things you have to talk about. Stratification, ripple marks, cross bedding, mud cracks, graded bedding, and trace fossils. So let's jump in. This first one is the stratification. You can also call it layering or lamination or sedimentary beds, bedding, these are all synonyms, the ones I just told you. Basically, when you see the differences with the horizontal layering, that's what we call stratification, lamination, bedding, um, layering, so all these. Now, the way we can see these different layers is could be because of uh, grain size change, like here, this is finer grain sediment, and in this layer it's coarser, finer, coarser, or it could be that you only see the different layers because of color changes, like here. So we can use both to be able to see stratification. 
The next one is the ripple marks. When we have ripple marks, basically what we look at is this, the bedding surface. Like you can imagine your bed at home, right here, and the sheets on your bed, basically where everything happens. That's when you lay. Here is your uh, head and everything. So that's that's the the bedding surface of your bed. And of course, if you go to the beach, that is the bedding surface for the sediment. So whatever happens on that bedding surface is going to be uh, staying there as sedimentary structures. We have sedimentary structures actually which you can see on the surface, the bedding surface, or you can also sometimes see it in the bed, the sedimentary beds like cross bedding. We're going to talk in a minute. So the ripple marks are seen always on the bedding surface and they are formed by, by current. We can have two kinds of current. If the current is unidirectional, which I mean one way, in one direction, which could be done by what? Yes, you're right. It could be done by either the, the river or it could be actually wind. And you understand the wind usually always goes in one way, the trade winds. So the wind direction is most of the time coming from the same way, just like the river. It always goes one way and we call it unidirectional. And in that case, you know, as the, as the wind or the river carries the sediment, it will make asymmetrical ripple mark, just like you see in here. These are the, really the little sand dunes. And you've been on the beach and you've seen ripple marks. They're going to be a little bit different than these because when you have waves going in and out, you're going to have very typical wave ripples, these. See, the wave ripples are always symmetrical where the current ripples are always going to be asymmetrical, just like here. So one side is longer than the other, longer, shorter, long, and so on. So that is what we call ripple marks. And when you look at the rocks, you will be able to tell the direction of the current, and you can also tell that it was made in the ocean because it will have the typical wave ripples. And I have some uh, examples right here, like right here. See, look at this one. When you have an asymmetrical ripper marks, so you can see here the side wave is going to be the so-called cross bedding. We're going to talk about it in a minute. But if you look at the bedding surface, which is like right here, then you can see that the, the ripple marks are going to be asymmetrical, longer on one side and much shorter on the other. Longer, shorter. Longer, shorter. And that helps us to tell that this was the direction of the current here, which made this. And right here, you can see that these are typical asymmetrical ripple marks. This is longer, shorter. Longer, shorter. Longer, shorter. So the direction of the current was right here, like this way. So this way, if you look at our ripple marks on any kind of rock outcrop, you will be able to tell which way the ancient river ran or which way was the trade with the wind at the time. So it's really amazing that this law information can give us so much uh, knowledge about past environments. It's really, really amazing. And this here is the typical wave ripple. See how the, the wave crests are right exactly in the middle. They are absolutely symmetrical. And the crest is always in the middle right here. I said, said, said that already. But the distance on both sides is exactly the same. So we call it wave ripple. And in this case, the ripple marks are symmetrical. And they are caused by the waves going in and out. So wave ripple and current ripple. The next one, a third sedimentary structure is the cross bedding. Basically, when you look at cross budding, you're looking at the side view of the wave ripples on top of each other. So if this is the current and the sand dune is being moved this way, and this is the, the uh, wind, windward side, and that's the lee side, the sediments, the slow force sets are being settled down on the on the the quiet side and you will have a layer with low forceps in it and again if you had a, a 
river or a wind carried current ripple, then on the side view you will see this so called cross bedding, but in every layer the angle of the cross bedding is going to be the same, especially if it was carried in river. If it was wind carried, then usually it's somewhat different, but the main direction is always the same, but the thickness and the angle of the low force set could be different. So this is what we call cross bedding. And this here shows you a very, very typical wind carried cross bedding. See the, the layers? The general direction of, the, of this low force sets are the same. However, one layer is really short, the other one is much thicker than there is another one. And there is a little bit of difference with the angle, like this one is a little bit more uh, low angle than this one. And then there is this one right here. So this is a really characteristic wind carried uh, cross bedding. This picture is done in, made in Zion National Park where the whole park is just full with this wind carried um, cross bedding. And this here shows you a typical um, marine cross bedding where one tide is bringing uh, the sets in one direction, and the other one is bringing it the opposite direction. So we call it herringbone cross bedding. And it's typically done by tidal currents. The next type of sedimentary structure are the mud cracks. The mud cracks, we already have talked about the clay minerals. That one thing which that is very characteristic to them, to them, them, that when they get wet they swell, but when they get dry they shrink. So if they are close to the surface and they have the chance to get wet and dry periodically, you're gonna end up having mud cracks, and you've seen it, so it's not a big deal. And remember. You have to do this so-called picture project by the end of the semester and these are the pictures you can take pictures of. If you if you have questions just ask me about the picture project in the lab. But this is a typical mud cracks I took the picture of in Belize which was pretty amazing and all we need is that when um, the next wet period is coming that sediment settles in between the cracks right here so therefore it gets preserved and later on we will be able to see it on the rock surfaces. I guess I'm gonna stop right here because I've been talking for 17 minutes and YouTube won't take it so I guess I will see you in the next segment.